Good afternoon to those of you who are joining us virtually. Thank you for tuning in to this um, in-person virtual event at Hudson Institute. My name is Rebecca Heinrichs, and I am a senior fellow here at Hudson. Today, we'll be discussing China's missile program. Of course, China's entire military is in the midst of a rapid buildup, including its growing long-range bomber force, its Blue Water Navy, and its space program. But today, we'll be, we will be primarily, but not exclusively, focusing on its missile force. And that's because of the special emphasis that China has placed on its missile force. Since the Cold War, the PLA rocket force has increasingly focused on the employment of precision-guided conventional ballistic and land attack cruise missiles. And the force was elevated in December of 2015 to a status co-equal to that of China's other military services. But not only that, it is in the midst, China is, in the midst of what STRATCOM's Admiral Richard has described as a strategic breakout. China is seeking to become a peer to the United States and Russia, and estimates um, put Beijing at likely doubling, if not tripling or quadrupling, its nuclear arsenal by the end of the decade. The Financial Times reported earlier this month that China launched two hypersonic missiles last summer. The launch, one of the launches using what is called a fractional orbital bombardment system, sent nuclear capable missiles into orbit before they landed mere miles away from their intended targets. We hope to discuss all of this today. Um, we won't have enough time to cover it all, but I have uh, distinguished panelists here to help us um, think about these things to look at some particularly high value areas where China might be um, looking to act aggressively, and then thinking about what the United States might be doing um, now to prepare to deter um, aggression against what the United States and our allies deem um, uh, key interests and vital interests. And then it should deterrence fail what the United States might do with our allies to defeat the adversary. And so um, today I am joined by Dr. Mark Lewis, Executive Director, Emerging Technologies Institute, National Defense Industrial Association. And my uh, esteemed colleague here, Timothy A. Walton, a um, uh, fellow here at Hudson, who works with the Center for Defense Concepts and Technology. And then Dr. Christopher uh, Yaw, Associate Executive Director, Strategic Deterrence and Nuclear Programs, National Strategic Research Institute at the University of Nebraska. Very thrilled to have all three of these gentlemen scholars here with me today to discuss these issues. What I'd like to do is I'm going to turn it over to each of them to make a few initial remarks, and then we will um, have a nice conversation and end at promptly at um, 1 o'clock your time for those who are watching it as we premiere it. Um, and so with that, Dr. Lewis, I will turn it over to you. Great. Well, thank, thank you so much for, for having us, and thanks for, for, for initiating this conversation. Um, I said when I, when I look at China, from a technology standpoint, one of the things that I'm very concerned about is the investments that the Chinese are making across the board in a range of technologies. Uh, everything from artificial intelligence to biotechnology, we know that they're trying to break out in areas such as microelectronics. Um, and of course, you mentioned hypersonics, and especially relevant to their missile program. The investments that we've seen the Chinese make in hypersonics are frankly startling. Um, to a certain extent, I have to tip my hat to them. They have made incredible progress in many cases because they built on work that we did. We took our foot off the gas. They saw an opportunity. They were able to build on our developments, build on our research. And, and uh, they, they have run with it. And it has given them a capability that, frankly, I believe right now is startling and is increasingly concerning. Um, you mentioned the fractional orbital bombardment test that was widely reported in the press. Um, that, to me, is notable for several reasons. One, it was a difficult thing to do technically. So it shows that the Chinese have clearly developed uh, a level of technical prowess that is um, notable. But it also shows intent. Um, I, th I think it was uh, uh, John Hyten, uh, who, uh, the former uh, Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, who said, you know, that clearly looks like a first strike capability. That's what that weapon looks like. And to me, it signals that the Chinese are looking at technologies that not only allow them to control the space in, in, their, in their immediate domain, Indo, Indo PACOM, um, they're looking at global capabilities, and they're using technologies to, to, to enhance that. So, so that, to me, is, is the big story about China. Now, I also will point out, and I hope we'll get a chance to discuss this, um, my, my other big concern about China is we know that they will not apply the same ethical standards to these, this range of technologies that we will. Things like artificial intelligence, things like biotechnology. We have very, very rigid ethical standards in how we would use artificial intelligence, what we would allow autonomous systems to do in the battlefield. 
um, I think we can have no confidence that the Chinese would apply those at all. Same thing with biotechnology. We have very, very rigid standards about what we will do and what we will, will not do in the area of biotechnology. And I think we've seen that the Chinese do not ha share, share those values and apply those standards. And that, to me, is a very, very startling realization. Great. Thank you. Uh, Timothy. Sure. Um, if I could, Rebecca, just talk a little bit about some precepts of Chinese strategy and then some projections, perhaps, about where the PLA rocket force may be going. Um, Chinese strategy focuses on gaining information dominance. Um, modern Chinese military theorists view confrontations between armies as taking place between what they call operational systems. These are combinations of command and control, uh, information and intelligence, networks, uh, fires, um, and support assets that all work together to make an army fight effectively. And their theory of victory, as uh, Jeff Engstrom of Rand and Mike Dom of MITRE have pointed out, really focuses on a system of systems confrontation in which the PLA wants to gain an advantage, uh, be able to paralyze uh, adversaries' uh, operational systems so that they lack the ability to resist and then lose the will to resist and ultimately capitulate. Um, to do this, the PLA has made a lot of investments and developed a strategy that focuses on offensive military operations, to gain a military advantage and to maintain it. Uh, they plan on conducting uh, key strikes using kinetic and non-kinetic weapons against uh, nodes in enemies' operational systems to have an outsized effect. And they want to maintain this initiative and, and gain it through uh, preventive attacks. They talk about conducting preventive attacks uh, against other countries and preemptive attacks of various kinds. So essentially conducting lots of surprise attacks to gain the initiative operationally, but also ideally uh, shock enemy leaders into capitulating before conflicts really even started. Um, the PLA rocket force figures very prominently in the PLA's conception of how they want to gain this initiative. And different PLA and PLA rocket force texts uh, articulate uh, the leading role of, of these types of capabilities. Um, Mark's talked a little bit, I think, about the, the broad challenges that the PLA is uh, presenting moving forward. I just wanted to highlight perhaps some three trends <coughs> regarding where the PLA's strike capabilities might go this decade. Uh, the first is I don't think the PLA rocket force is going to slow down. Uh, the PLA has signaled that they plan on increasing the type, number, and range of missiles in its arsenal. And I think this is because they recognize it's a very effective class of weapons. Um, it can deliver uh, weapons with a very high probability of arrival, even against defended targets and accurately target these key nodes that I was talking about in the enemy's operational systems. It can also do it at a relatively low risk to the launch platforms themselves. And even though the individual cost of some of these long-range munitions may be high, when you look at the cost to generate the effect uh, and compare it to some other delivery options, and when you account for attrition, I think it's quite reasonable. Um, there's also, I think, as you pointed out, Rebecca, now that it's its own service, there are lots of bureaucratic, organizational, and industrial dynamics that push the PLA rocket force to continue to improve and, and not want to slow down. Um, our estimates suggest that even if we use some very conservative assumptions regarding PLA rocket force launcher uh, numbers and production rates of missiles, the PLA could reach about 3,000 missiles by 2030 from around 2,000 missiles in 2020 or 2021. Uh, second major trend is that there are other components of the PLA's strike capabilities that are continuing to improve and are becoming increasingly integrated with the, the rocket force. Uh, the PLA rocket force certainly gets a lot of attention in the press, and rightfully so. Uh, but if you look at the bulk of the fires in a potential campaign, it would likely come from PLA aircraft. Um, our analysis suggests that PLA aircraft would be able to deliver about three times as many munitions every day as the entire PLA rocket force inventory. And if they wouldn't suffer high levels of attrition, they could come back the next day and keep delivering those weapons day after day. So it's a major threat, and the PLA is improving it. Uh, they're fielding um, modernized JH-7 fighter bombers, new classes of stealthy UAVs, uh, the GHXX theater bomber and the H-20 intercontinental bomber will likely come online uh, this decade. And the H-20 likely has the potential to be able to strike targets in Alaska, Hawaii, and beyond. Uh, we're also seeing the PLA start to field uh, Y-20 aerial refueling tankers. And those will extend the range of PLA strike aircraft, but also escort aircraft, like the J-20, that could clear a path for the bombers and get the bombers to, to more favorable launch positions. So it's a multifaceted threat that the PLA is presenting, and it's very complex. And then the, the third trend I'll, I'll briefly offer that's perhaps a bit more speculative um, is that PLA missiles may go abroad. 
the PLA has articulated a desire to establish a global network of bases. They're working on this. Um, they have a, the world's leading navy, largest navy today. And they're already incorporating onto different surface combatants like the Type 55, different long-range missiles that could strike targets ashore or at sea. We're also seeing, though, at different Chinese trade shows, for instance, uh, interest in containerized launcher systems that could fire either missiles or uh, UAVs, including lethal UAVs of various kinds. And these containerized launchers, we run the risk of them being able to either uh, overtly, covertly, or clandestinely operate them from explicit Chinese bases, Chinese ports, or uh, even merchant vessels that, that have been converted. So it's a significant threat that I think underscores the fact that <clears throat> The air missile defense challenges posed by China are not just a regional Indo-Pacific challenge, but rather a global one. And as the PLA expands, our allies and partners, wherever they are, are going to need to deal with this threat. Great. A um, lot of great information from the first two. And we just have more bad news coming. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, Chris, I'm going to yeah. turn it over to you um, thanks, to talk a, a little bit of what the Chinese um, is doing on, on the nuclear front. Great. Thanks, Rebecca. And, and thanks to, to Hudson for uh, convening this panel. Uh, it's, it's an important subject. Um, on, on the nuclear front, uh, I think Admiral Richard says it best when he says, look, the, the, the scope of the acceleration is breathtaking. Um, what the public mostly sees are like the silo bases. So, so you, you have three new bases, lots of silos, probably going to about 300 um, uh, when all is said and done. Those silos can all then be filled with ICBMs, uh, the D, presumably the DF-41, potentially with uh, multiple RVs. Um, but that's just part of the, uh, part of the program, right? So that, that's just what we see mostly. The rest is kind of veiled in this opacity, this great wall of secrecy, some people have called it. Um, it's very hard to penetrate what they're doing. Uh, we see other expansions, though. For example, Ping Tong is where they produce their nuclear weapons, uh, it's similar to the US uh, Rocky Flats and Pantex, uh, back when we had Rocky Flats 30, 30 plus years ago. Um, so uh, that, that complex has under, uh, undergone a large expansion, uh, an expansion that looks to be larger than could be uh, assumed away by saying, well, they just need some RVs for the DF-41. Um, our, our kind of proprietary pr private uh, you know, estimates on the numbers are somewhere in the 700s, not the 200s or 300s for uh, operational nuclear warheads, probably doubling um, uh, by the end of the decade. And some of that would be the silo force. Some of that would be the theater force. And so the theater force is, uh, is really the second most concerning thing. One of the things that uh, Admiral Richard has said is that the, that the Chinese have positioned themselves so that they can essentially execute any plausible nuclear strategy that they wish. Um, what that means is that we have to think beyond the numbers, sort of Cold War thinking of let's compare all the numbers of all the different types of, of nuclear systems. Um, of course, they've got a lot of uh, nuclear systems. Of course, the numbers are going up, whether it's the ballistic missile force or the bomber force uh, with, uh, with cruise missiles or air launch ballistic missiles, um, FOBs, as you mentioned. Uh, so all of this across the board is attempting uh, to deliver a strategy. A, a, these are capabilities that underwrite a strategy. The question is, what is this nuclear strategy? Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people have said, hey, look, they're racing toward parity with the United States in terms of nuclear numbers. Um, again, the numbers are not so important. What, they're, what they are actually achieving is a, a strategic force, and what we call strategic meaning what we would be covered under treaty. Uh, none of China's nuclear warheads are under treaty. Um, a strategic force that essentially acts as apocalypse insurance, if you will. Um, and, uh, and, and then underneath that, there's a theater nuclear force that allows them to do um, discretionary, selective, highly selective targeting in theater with nuclear forces um, should all of these other balances not actually swing in their favor in an actual conflict. Um, so we're, um, we, we're talking about whether it's hypersonics or space or cyber or uh, run the entire AI, run the entire gamut of non-nuclear capabilities. Um, the United States is good at competing in those areas. 
And, and we may well counterbalance them in all of those areas. The one place, the one military capability that the United States has demonstrated a non-will to compete in, the sole military capability, is theater nuclear forces. Um, ever since our divestment of those forces in the 90s, uh, the United States has walked away, um, despite the fact that Russia uh, retrenched itself into theater nuclear forces and China continues to expand its theater nuclear forces. Th those forces are important because those are the forces that they will use if things start going badly for them in a conflict. They're also the forces that give them the confidence to go into that conflict in the first place mm -hmm. because there's the, like this escalatory hole uh, in which we really can't play because we've seeded that ground. They're filling that hole. That's, that's the gravitational attraction for them, is to go where the adversary is not willing to go. Um, it, and that's really similar across any competitive space. I mean, athletics, you see it in athletics all the time. Um, if a team is not willing to invest in a certain type of capability, other teams are going to exploit that. Um, and so that's the big worry that I have, is that this is a nuclear strategy designed to, to underwrite their aggressive actions. Okay, thank you very much. Those are three great um, uh, original presentations. I, I want to I talk then about what the United States should be doing now. Now, there's been some chatter um, that uh, because of, of everything that we just laid out here, it's so formidable um, that because of the, the geographic asymmetry, it's, it's right there close to China. Taiwan is going to be the most likely flashpoint, although not necessarily the only flashpoint. Um, where there could be conflict between the United States and our ally, with our allies um, and China, but, but Taiwan is the, the one that's talked about the most. Um, but that it, we, we are at such a disadvantage that um, there isn't much we can do. Um, that is not the view of the, of the panelists here, that, <laughs> that uh, there, we don't have a defeatist attitude. There actually is a lot that the United States can do and should do, and it is worth doing because of U.S. interests. So let's start. Let's talk about that. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Mark, and the national defense strategy should, is, is supposed to come out sometime this month, so right. we can talk about some of the things that we would like to see, the kind of language we'd like to see in there, um, and um, based on these things, and then also just your view on, 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 the, on the critical importance of Taiwan and what the United States should be doing in order to sure. deter Sure. Uh, aggression against it. So first, you know, my starting point for the national defense strategy, um, I'm a big fan of the 2018 national defense strategy. <laughs> there were a few elements in that that I think especially jump out as, as, as providing goodness. One, it identifies China and Russia, but primarily China as a pure competitor that we need to be focused on. And you know the, the as they say the, the the first steps for a recovering alcoholic to admit that they're to, to, for an alcoholic to recover is to admit that they're an alcoholic. Well, the first step is to admit we've got a problem, and that's what the 2018 strategy did. So that's one one thing that I, I want to see that continue. The next is that the the that strategy I think correctly identified a list of technologies that are critical to our future capabilities. Um, if you distill it out, it comes out to about uh, 10 or 11 individual technologies, everything from cyber to communications, hypersonic, space, biotechnology is, is, comes out in the mix. Um, that to me is also absolutely critical. We need to acknowledge that our invest we have allowed some investments to fall by the wayside, and we need to reinvigorate that. Now, I will say, in the past couple of years, the, the Pentagon has actually taken the right steps. Um, there, there's actually been significant effort made to invest in, few, in, in key technology areas. Um, frankly, some of those efforts have been more successful than others. But at least it's the beginning of the acknowledgement that we have a problem and we need to step up to the plate. So what are those areas? Well, obviously, I'm, you know, I have strong emphasis on hypersonics. I think that's one of the, one of the key technology areas. Um, the good news is that coming out of the last administration, uh, there were significant resources put into hypersonics. And with this new administration, those resources have continued. So when the most recent uh, Pentagon budget dropped, uh, there were very, very, uh, in, there were relatively insignificant changes to the large plus up in hypersonics that had been put into place. So, so that's good from several standpoints, not the least of which is it's showing us that both sides of the aisle recognize the importance of this technology and, and the threat. And that needs to continue. I think we see a continued emphasis on the importance of areas such as artificial intelligence, biotechnology, and most recent NDAA uh, biotechnology gets called out explicitly in the same way that artificial intelligence was called out in, 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 in previous years. So that's all good. 
But having said that, we need to be looking across the board of those technologies and asking the question, frankly, what is going to scare China? Um, if our idea of hypersonics is producing five missiles, doing a demonstration, declaring success, put, and, 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 and going home, that's not going to scare anyone. Mm -hmm. We need to be producing these technologies at scale. We can't stop at 10 hypersonic weapons or 100. We need to be in the thousands to mm -hmm. actually have an, have an impact. <clears throat> Same thing with artificial intelligence. What's going what's to scare China? Just developing capabilities, doing a demonstration, having DARPA fly an artificial intelligence system against the pilot, that's, those, those demonstrations are great. We need to follow through. We need to deliver those capabilities into the battlefield. And that's, that's the path that I want to see us on as our new strategies are evolving. Um, and, and then just, to, just real quick then, too, and so you think not, not just a de, um, developing them at scale, but then also testing. Can you say something about the, necess the necessity yeah, absolutely. of yeah. increasing the tempo of testing? So, so it's, it's, it, I, 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 that, that's a great question. So uh, last week, I actually read an op-ed where someone was claiming that we're going too fast in hypersonics. And I wanted to scream and rip that op-ed in, in pieces. Because in fact, it's the opposite. We're going too slowly in hypersonics. And one of the reasons we're going too slowly is because of our testing limitations. We spend decades uh, uh, decommissioning tunnels, making it more difficult for us to do flight tests. And the NDA AA actually addresses that as well. So the Pentagon has now been given a, a go-do to do an assessment of testing. We need to rebuild our testing infrastructure. That means ground test capability, but more importantly, flight test capability. We need to be testing more, more often. We need, to be, uh, uh, we need to be in the air. When things fail, we need to get back into the air more quickly. One of the, one of the horrible stories, I think, that comes out when we compare what China's been doing to what the US has been doing, their testing rate has been absolutely phenomenal. And their success at testing has been phenomenal, because when you do something often enough, you get good at it. And if you look at our testing, it's been an embarrassment. We've had failure after failure. And, and I, I think it's pretty straightforward. Why? Because we, we have gotten, we have, it, we, we've, we've lost the bubble on how to do this. We, we're not, we, we, we haven't trained people on how to do this sort of testing. And we make it so difficult that every failure leads to a major production and months and months of delay. So that's definitely something that needs to be fixed. And then I know something else that uh, General Hyten talked about too is um, that sometimes whenever you fail, you still learn a lot from those failures. And so we actually have to, it's a cultural problem that rather than um, taking so much time after each failed test, we have to just yes. more quickly no, learn from that. And I, get going. I do caution them. I try to divide failures into two bins. There are smart failures and dumb failures. Smart failures are when you thought you understood something, you fly it, you do whatever, and it doesn't work, and you learn from it. Dumb failures are the fin falls off, the battery voltage is low, it's bad systems engineering. And we can never use the first category as an excuse for the second. Unfortunately, we've been seeing a lot in the second category recently, and that gets back to our lack of testing tempo, the lack of experience of our teams, and our lack of, uh, lack of infrastructure. Great. Um, Timothy, National Defense Strategy, it's supposed to come out this month. Um, we have now mentioned this, this phrase, competition, great power competition, which is better than not acknowledging that, that, that <laughs> China is um, um, not just merely just a friendly country that we trade with. Um, but are we really competing, or is it more confrontation, possibly? And are there, um, would it be more useful? What would you like to see out of the national defense strategy in terms of language and thinking that gets us planning for um, uh, deterring and then defeating the adversary should deterrence fail? Sure, it's a great question. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, in terms of the national defense strategy, I'd say that the most important priority is a commitment by the Secretary of Defense, Austin, to closely work with Congress to actually implement it. Um, the, uh, if anything, like the sort of stark outlook presented by Admiral Davidson, who was the, the former Indo-Pacific Command commander, is possible uh, this decade, DOD really should be making some major changes in terms of reevaluating its priorities and directing resources towards those most important concepts and capabilities that can dissuade or deter aggression moving forward. Um, unfortunately, I think DOD right now has a bit of a credibility issue with Congress. Um, after DOD essentially ignored Congress in uh, last year's budget proposal, uh, when they pretty much didn't put any funds towards the, the original intent of the Section 1242 Indo-Pacific Deterrence Initiative language, and after lots of study, this global posture review came out, and at least the public reporting suggests that the conclusion was US posture is OK. So it was surprising, and I think that this really hasn't been helpful in terms of building a good relationship with Congress. Um, what could be some good steps moving forward now that hopefully the defense strategy will be released? I'd say is first, we should see uh, sort of some significant uh, construction of infrastructure and logistics projects being launched throughout the Indo-Pacific uh, this year. 
Uh, perhaps the authors of the Global Posture Review thought it would be better to talk less and do more, and, and I think that's very wise. Maybe you know, a decent number of these projects probably should be classified or at least shouldn't be publicly released. But regardless, if we are acting with the haste and urgency we need, we should be seeing a lot more being done in terms of posture and new projects being launched or, or existing ones being modified uh, this year. Uh, another area that, that I think is relevant to focusing on the most important priorities, uh, and that could be a bellwether for change, is in the Department of the Army budget. So over the past several years, the Army has done, I think, a very good job through their night court process of focusing on their top six modernization priorities. So they've optimized to steer funding to conduct uh, research and development of their modernization priorities, and that's been going very well. But as some of these technologies now reach um, some growing levels of maturation, and as budgets are either flat or inflation eats them up, um, there's going to probably need to be greater prioritization within that R&D portfolio, picking some winners and losers, or at least sequencing the, the, the programs a bit more. And then I think there's also going to need to be a more critical look at Army force structure itself. Um, Army Secretary Christine Wormuth has, I think, effectively articulated the Army's role in the Indo-Pacific, uh, providing protection, long-range fires, communication, logistics, and all these capabilities. But if the Army is actually going to focus on that mission, it needs to scale that up a lot more than what we're seeing right now in the Indo-Pacific. And that's going to require, I think, rebalancing from some other capabilities that aren't as relevant to either the Pacific or European contingency, to be honest, and bringing those forward. So, for example, if, if the Army were to cut a single active component striker brigade combat team, um, it could save over the course of five years more than $9 billion that you could then reinvest into air and missile defenses, for instance, to counter all, all the Chinese strike threats that we've been talking about. Those, though, require some big choices and big trades moving forward that I think apply some different metrics regarding what's success for the Army, where maybe it's not just the size of the force, but the effectiveness of the force in in a Taiwan scenario, a Japan scenario, or, or some other scenario moving forward. Great. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep you here for just a minute more then, since you talked about those strike threats. Can, can you give us just some, you've, you've, we've talked a lot about missile defense, air and missile defense, and the importance of hardening some of these critical assets that the U.S. is going to, has there now in the region and should have more of. Mm -hmm. can, you can you talk about that, the importance of um, um, both active and passive defenses in terms of prioritizing um, what we should be doing um, in, in the area. Uh, certainly. Um, I'd say sort of on the whole, uh, the current U.S. air and missile defense capabilities are relatively brittle. And so it, it's an architecture that I think could be relatively easily neutralized um, or paralyzed by an adversary like China. Um, uh, there have been a number of studies, I think, over the past decade by organizations like RAND that have uh, conducted sort of an examination of the trade space and identified a set of solutions but now I think we need to stop from just admiring the problem of defense of Guam, defense of Okinawa, defense of any other location, and actually move to resourcing the most promising capabilities and concepts to address the challenges moving forward. Now, some of the areas that I think have lots of value, um, I'd start off by saying first in terms of the area of passive defenses. Uh, passive defenses include investments like additional infrastructure so you could uh, disperse more, uh, redundancy, reconstitution equipment, uh, hardening of some sites, camouflage concealment and deception. All of these capabilities, um, analysis after analysis, have proven that they're very effective in terms of forcing adversaries to increase the salvo size they would need to launch, which at the very least imposes an opportunity cost at the tactical and operational level. And then also in terms of allowing friendly forces to continue to conduct operations. Um, because as, as we've discussed, China has an enormous strike capacity and it's only growing greater each year. So the goal really shouldn't be to establish a perfect defense everywhere, uh, but rather appropriate levels of defenses and then reconstitution capabilities so that that port, airfield, communication site, uh, whatever it is, can continue operations even though an attack takes place. And passive defenses, um, right now the, the bulk of air missile defense investments really go towards active uh, investments and active capabilities, but I think some additional investment towards passive systems uh, could have lots of value. And then briefly, the other area is in, in terms of making air and missile defense forces themselves more survivable. Yeah. Um, currently, air missile defense architecture, especially our ground-based air defenses, are really optimized to provide defense against small salvos from less advanced foes like North Korea or Iran. When going up against China, it's likely that these forces would be uh, targeted and then promptly destroyed, which would then open up the door to continued follow-on attacks by aircraft and, and other assets moving forward. So 
to make those air missile defense forces more survivable, I think we need to uh, make some basic and straightforward investments like more personnel in air defense artillery units so they can have more tactical mobility, can follow some best practices in terms of tactics, techniques, and procedures. Um, some camouflage, concealment, and deception technologies. Um, ad additional passive and multi-static uh, sensors. Um, some investments so that their systems are actually more tactically mobile. And then some new kinetic and non-kinetic um, effectors. Um, a lot of these technologies are relatively mature, but do require some more integration moving forward. And uh, I think th the good news is that we can reorient our funding to focus on these most important capabilities and make it so that we're fielding the necessary forces within the, the coming two, three, five years to address some of these challenges. And, and you think, and that was a great last point to, to end on for this round too, because that the timing matters. Just when talk, just that the window is, is actually now. <laughs> Uh, I, in terms I really of the agree. sense of urgency. Correct, because there are some capabilities that are going to take a lot more time to develop in terms of some advanced interceptors or some advanced non-kinetic systems to counter perhaps the more stressing hypersonic threats, for instance. That's going to take some more time. There are lots of, though, low-hanging fruit opportunities to, that just require more personnel, require more software writing to, to be able to link different systems, or we require buying some off-the-shelf capabilities that we have but we just haven't prioritized uh, for different reasons. The, the latest National Defense Authorization Act actually had some, I think, promising language for what they called a mission manager program. And it's gonna be a pilot program in which the Office of the Secretary of Defense's Strategic Capabilities Office is supposed to work with uh, combatant commanders to ch solve challenging operational problems. They identified Defense of Guam and its surrounding areas as one of them. And hopefully this could be a, a funding vehicle and a mechanism to improve, I think, this interaction between combatant commanders and OSD and steer funding towards those high payoff capabilities. Great. Um, now, Chris, the, there's, there's recently a, a really nice P5 statement um, <laughs> uh, where these nuclear powers came and said that they're um, essentially all committed um, to this idea that uh, nuclear war cannot be won. And, and, and what, what, what do you have to say about that, about China's um, participation in that, in that statement and um, looking at their force, um, about how they're thinking about it? And then I'd love to hear you um, give us uh, some ideas about what you'd like to see in the nuclear posture review, because the nuclear posture review is going to come out after the national defense um, strategy. And, and so what would you like to see in there um, that demonstrates to, to us that, that this administration understands the threat and that, um, that we need to be responding in a way to, to have a credible deterrence um, based on what the Chinese are investing in. Right. Thanks, Thanks Rebecca. Yeah. Um, uh, interesting statements, yes, coming out of the P5. Uh, uh, both of those statements. Ar Article 6, uh, we're all committed to Article 6, and we all believe that a nuclear war cannot be won and therefore should not be fought. Um, it, it is probably counterproductive, but I would argue it's counterproductive for the United States uh, to, to join in uh, in that kind of hypocr hip hip hypocritical uh, declaration of the, of the P5, because clearly two of those five don't believe either of those things, right? So uh, it is inconsistent. All of China's uh, breathtaking expansion of their nuclear program is inconsistent with a commitment to the Article 6 of the NPT. Yeah. Um, uh, obviously, they are in an arms race. Additionally, both Russia and China are, are pursuing theater range nuclear systems uh, at the ultra low, very low, low yield level that are designed to be employed in warfare. Um, that is inconsistent with, with a statement that nuclear war should not be fought because it cannot be won. Um, so both of those statements, um, in fact, uh, are, are not uh, believable um, when you look at the posture of either Russia or China. And, and we should not join in that uh, hypocrisy, I think. Um, as far as the NPR, I, I think uh, first rule, do no harm. Uh, I, I think there are a lot of harmful uh, potential uh, discussions going on, uh, whether that's uh, sole uh, sole purpose, or no first use, or um, eliminating a leg of the triad, or well, instead of investing in GBSD, which is a modernization of the ICBM leg, let's just try to hobble along the uh, the Minuteman Three. 
Um, none of those are good ideas, and, and they should all be rejected. Um, and, and hopefully they will be. Uh, I think the second thing that we have to kind of, there's a it's kind of a reset as we look at the threat posed by Russia and China. And this is a threat, again, not just based on numbers, but based on their strategy, based on their planning, based on how they think they're going to execute a war uh, should war come with the United States. Um, based on all of those things, we need to make sure that our mindset is the modernization of the triad is the floor and not the ceiling for nuclear modernization. Um, Unfortunately, that's a little bit of bad news because it's, it's expensive, just like all the other capabilities that we've talked about here. Um, these are all expensive. Um, uh, nevertheless, they're needed. And in particular, as you look at escalation space and you see this gap in theater nuclear escalation, the gap that, uh, that I would argue Russia and China are both building forces and plans to exploit um, we need to close that gap. We need to do something uh, to countervail against those capabilities. Now, in the last NPR, which I was a, a, a good fan of since I was at DOE uh, when, when uh, we worked on it, um, we uh, put forward two very modest um, amendments to the nuclear posture. And that was the, the low-yield 76 and the sub-launched or sea-launched cruise missile uh, nuclear. Both of those should be retained. Um, we should recommit on the Silicon N. Uh, that, is, that is the capability that will message to both Russia and China that they, can, they cannot see a gap in theater nuclear escalation and exploit it without cost. It will come at great cost. Now, do we need to have the same numbers of, uh, of systems? No. We just need to have a, a reasonable, a plausible countervailing capability that will convince the adversary that they cannot go there without incurring great cost. Right now, they both believe that that's an area where they can escalate to, and, and essentially we don't have an answer because we won't go to the strategic nuclear level, and we don't really have theater nuclear forces. Um, so I would say that's, the, that's another thing we, have, we would want to look at. And then finally, as we look kind of deeper into the 21st century, it's clear that, that Russia and China, um, both long-term competitors, are, are looking to um, uh, build forces uh, suitable for their strategies. We, we talked about strategies earlier. They, they have a nuclear strategy that they would like to employ these nuclear forces within, and we need to be able to adapt. We have to have some resiliency in our system and adaptability in our system so that if we need a dual-capable system fairly rapidly and at a reasonably low expense, that the NNSA infrastructure can deliver that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think if we set NNSA up to on that kind of uh, a, an adaptive footing, that would go a long way to, to assuring allies and to deterring uh, would-be aggressors. Namely, you can't get by uh, and think that there's going to be zero cost to you if you escalate across the nuclear threshold. And, and so just, just to be clear, too, so everything that you just said, I mean, the, the point here is that the United States is still seeking to deter, and we still have time to deter. Yes. And that it's the Chinese that might be um, something that, that analysts talked a lot more about publicly in previous years about what the Russians were doing, that the Chinese might be thinking of um, possibly employing a low-yield nuclear weapon in a purely conventional yes. conflict. And so the aim for the United States at this point is to convince them that that would not be worth the cost in order to successfully um, increase the credibility of our deterrent. Absolutely. Because we're not the ones that are threatening, um, of course, the of nuclear war. It's, it's it's the Chinese. And so, so my question then is, you know, you'll, you'll, have, you'll have some people say, listen, the, the Chinese are investing in all of these um, particular systems because it, they're, they're, they, are feeling, um, they are feeling intimidated. This is sort of a natural outgrowth of all of the U.S. nuclear modernization program, that this is something that um, any, any country, self-respecting country, would do, that if it just wants to compete with the United States, that we shouldn't view this as 
um, threatening um, because we are really the the cause, the first cause. What what would be your response to that? I I, I know you're gonna you've got written this great piece about how it's been the absence of U.S. investment. Absolutely. But if you can um, uh, talk more about that in particular, about and just flesh that out that this is this is something new. And it's an outgrowth of Chinese aims, political aims, about what they might be considering. Absolutely. Just- yeah, yeah. It's, that's 100% correct, Rebecca. So the United States in the 90s divested essentially of all of our uh, theater nuclear mm-hmm. forces. Um, under the presidential nuclear initiatives, the first round and the second round, um, the United States withdrew all the way to just a small number of B-61s mm-hmm. um, located in Europe. And, and that's it for theater nuclear forces. Uh, that is in stark, uh, stark contrast to Russia, who began uh, to, to uh, adhere to the PNIs because they were reciprocal and, and rather quickly then um, backslid uh, back to a posture that is heavily theater nuclear forces. Meanwhile, China continued to accelerate its theater nuclear forces through the, a variety of delivery systems, ballistic missiles predominantly, um, everything from the DF-15 all the way to the DF-31 could be considered theater, uh, a theater force as well. Not that maybe not the 31A, of course, but the 31. Um, all of those, together with the potential yield testing, so something that the United States uh, went forward with in the 90s was a zero yield uh, uh, test policy, meaning under the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which which we signed but was not ratified. Um, by the Senate. Uh, nevertheless, we adhere to a moratorium. And under that moratorium, U.S. policy is zero yield means zero nuclear yield, period. That is not, clearly not, the, the policy concoction for Russia and China. Zero yield for them means as long as the other side can't detect it. Uh, that's, that's zero enough. Um, so they've been testing all along and really with the intent of supporting these low-yield nuclear warheads that they've been building. In fact, there's a new test, uh, a new test site, uh, test area in the nuclear test site in China, which is, it doesn't get a lot of media play, but it's there and it's being uh, actively used. So um, that's, again, in stark contrast to the United States. It's not the United States that's expanding uh, nuclear testing. It's, it's China and, and also Russia. Um, when you look at um, at, at the introduction of this, the low number of 76 uh, low yields um, from the last uh, administration's NPR. That's a very small number. It's a very, very modest um, uh, increase compared to, take again, for example, the Ping Tong complex, a vast expansion of that, of that complex. They are clearly turning out large numbers of nuclear warheads, and they position themselves to do so over the long term. Um, that's, that is not where we are. In fact, NNSA has the goal by 2030 to be able to produce 80. Um, I would say uh, China has already positioned itself to produce 80 right now, and, and they're producing those. Um, so again, there, there it gives the lie to, the, to this concept that it was the United States' aggressive uh, modernization in nuclear um, that was, that's fueling this. It's not. Right. And I'm actually going to jump to Timothy and then back over to Mark. Um, I, I want, want to talk about the doability of all of this. Yeah. Okay. I, I, because I think that this is really important. We can, we can start talking about everything that China's doing because part of the problem, as Mark mentioned, is first of all, we have to admit what the problem is. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and we have to be able to be much more comfortable talking about the different things that China's investing in, in particular, and why they're doing it, which is to push the United States out of the region or to have the ability to coerce um, particular uh, to, to coerce the United States. In other words, these are not pure, uh, purely for defensive purposes. Okay, so um, there is a tendency then, perhaps, to maybe not outright have a defeatist attitude. It's too hard, but take a much more modest approach to what can be done. Um, and um, you and I have talked, sort of, um, uh, here at work, that that's not the right approach. That we should have a more um, um, realistic and optimistic attitude about what can be done and where we are in the timeline mm-hmm. um, in order to, um, to to really successfully get some of these things. You talked about some great progress with Congress, um, but but can you talk to me a little bit more about um, uh, just the doability 
the doability of deterring Chinese action and what you're looking in particular and what you're most concerned about that China might do in terms of acting aggressively against Taiwan um, and, and sort of and, and why these particular things that you have mentioned are in fact doable and in an appropriate timeline if the United States has a political will and can in a bipartisan fashion focus on them. I think that's right, Rebecca, thank you. Um, I think over the past decade, we've seen this swing from, I'd say, lots of arrogance, perhaps, that the U.S. was technologically superior or had more military experience or that Chinese technology was too immature, to now, I think, a growing sense of fatalism, perhaps, that the U.S. wouldn't be capable of aiding its allies or partners in the Philippines, Taiwan, Japan, Korea in their hour of need. I think the truth is probably somewhere in between, um, but we will need to, I think, focus on those promising concepts and capabilities to be able to counter the Chinese, um, and specifically how I think we want to create the conditions where we could deny uh, their aims of, the, of, of aggression, or at the very least impose sufficiently high costs that Chinese leaders will reconsider the use of force. Um, to do that, though, I think we need to have a much better understanding of Chinese command and control and Chinese decision making, and where do we target our efforts moving forward, and actually have capabilities and concepts that target that and exploit it moving forward. Um, Sometimes I think there's uh, a view that Chinese decisions are irrevoc irrevocable, right? Um, and that the CCP, once they've made a decision to attack Taiwan or any other location, would never go back. Our research suggests that's really not the case. They can change their decisions. The CCP is likely more stable than many people give them credit for. But there are, I think, some high value areas where if we have some new concepts and capabilities and we can feel them at scale, we can shape Chinese decision making. It is, though, going to require a much better understanding of Chinese and Chinese Communist Party decision making akin to what we had of the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And that's going to require, I'd say, lots of effort on the part of the intelligence community to gain that intel assessment and then conduct operations to shape their decision making during the competition phase so we won't get to a conflict. And then, of course, you know, it always gets back to a, it's a p political matter, small, small p. Uh, and, um, in terms of um, what our government needs to be able to, to face the reality mm -hmm. that, that this isn't merely just a friendly competition with another country that abides by the same rules and procedures and that, that you know, that we have, like we have competition with the Brits and the French. It's not, it's not like that. Um, and so it really is more like a Cold War scenario. It's more confrontational. And so we should be um, uh, thinking about it that way and then, and then uh, thinking about our defense strategy that way too. Mm -hmm. um, Mark, you can yeah. comment on anything that either sure. of those two said too before I get to my question. So I, 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 let, me, let me first comment on This is an, existent, an existential threat, and we need to view it in that way. Um, I've, had, I've had people say, oh, but we're going to get into an arms race. Guess what? We're already in the race. Mm -hmm. The Chinese are running the race, whether or not we choose to participate or not, and that needs to be our mindset. I, I, I think the comment that was made earlier that, that we haven't provoked this from the Chinese except by creating a period when we took our foot off the gas. We created yes. our own vulnerabilities. We stopped investing in areas. We stopped pursuing technologies as rapidly and as aggressively as we should have. And we did even worse. And you know, I, apologies for coming back to the hypersonics analogy, but we did even worse. We demonstrated the technology in the 2010s. It all worked. It was proven out. And then we stopped doing it. And then even worse, we released position papers. Where we said, this is really key technology. This is an area we need to invest. We, we basically handed it off, off to them and showed them an opportunity that, that, that mm -hmm. they could jump into. And, and, and frankly, we made it easy for them. So I, I want to come back to your point of, is it doable? I, I would venture to say none of us would do what we did. None of us would be in the, in, the, in the fields that we're in if we thought it wasn't doable. We'd probably all head to cabins in the woods somewhere <laughs> and, and hold up with cans of, uh, cans of, 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 uh, of, of food. Um, obviously, it's doable. Um, you know, I, 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 the United States is still the science and technology leader. Um, for me, the most telling point is bright Chinese students still want to come and study in our universities, not vice versa. Now, if that ever changes, we really have a problem. Mm -hmm. But for now, that's the case. Um, we have friends, partners, and allies in, in, in science and technology in a way that the Chinese never will not for quite some time, I suspect, never will. And that, that is our advantage. We also have incredibly bright, innovative minds. The way we tackle this, though, is we unleash those minds. We allow them to innovate. We remove some of the shackles. We, we all talk about how antiquated our acquisition processes are. 
Um, Heidi Hsu, the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, very recently talked about how the POM process means you've got a two-year window. So if you've got an innovative idea, well, if you want to incorporate it, you better have anticipated that innovative idea two years ago or else you're not going to get it into, get it into the hands of your warfighter. We need to make those changes, and, and, and those are being acknowledged. And, and again, at the same time, we're seeing people stepping up to the plate, investing across the board in everything from artificial intelligence, biotechnology, uh, cyber, um, all, all those technologies that we know that are important. We just need to pursue it now. We, we need to stop. We need to end the start-stop cycles that, that have crippled our capabilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, you know, this, this panel today has been focused on what the United States should be doing, and we haven't even talked about all the things that our allies um, can be doing, are doing, need to do more, need to do better, um, especially Taiwan when it comes to their own defense and what they need to be doing so that they can hold the line in time for everybody else to, to get there. Um, uh, when, and, when and if that does happen, of course, we're working, um, the purpose of this panel is to thinking about how, how can we be investing in the right kinds of capabilities and deployments to get on the front end of that to deter those acts of aggression from happening in the first place. Thank you all so much for, for your research and analysis and for being here today to discuss this important topic. And thank you all for joining us for this virtual event here at Hudson Institute.